Hello everyone, so I am a geographer, I work on urban environments and uh, we introducing this whole course of 15 sessions I think uh, with Luc Abadi uh, who is an ecologist and uh, I am also the director of the Center for Earth Politics at the University of Paris Cité and Luc is the director of the Institute for Environmental Transition at Sorbonne University, okay. so we're sharing well, uh, positions. So, ah. yeah, I don't sure. well, I for person, no. okay, and let's sure. tap Okay, so as you have seen this summer, I mean, there are multiple catastrophes all over the place, all over Earth. And these catastrophes have been made more and more visible through media, through policies, through everything. So, and there is another thing, is the cumulative impacts of these catastrophes. It's not only about climates, we would have uh, time to talk about it. It's about planetary boundaries. It concerns nitrogen, for example, or biodiversity issues, as Luc will talk about it. And we can expect that the cumulative impacts of these catastrophes will be far greater than the catastrophes independent, independently. What is at stake, from my point of view, is the habitability of the Earth. It's not only, uh, uh, it's not only in terms of uh, environment, you could say, but also in terms of policy making, in terms of reaction, action, collective action, and uh, a different set of values that we will be able or not to implement. So, one can wonder, we have been working with Luc more than 30 years on these issues. And at the time when we started to look at that and the environmental issues, uh, we, I didn't think possible that we could get to this stage. I mean, uh, for me, it was impossible that collectively we couldn't get uh, to be aware of the catastrophe that was looming in the horizon and that we couldn't react to it. I mean, that was like unthinkable. And in 2010, after Copenhagen, I started to think about that and seeing that people didn't react to what was coming ahead. And, well, when you think about it, why we didn't react, individually but also collectively? One of the di uh, points of the diagnosis is the importance of biophysical mat materiality, which was largely ignored because of how ways of looking at the world, of looking only at social uh, actions and not taking into account both in the Marxist tradition and in the capitalist tradition, the, the, the weight of our action on a mate, materialist uh, uh, level. So also you can say the human society organize themselves on the principle of predation what you call uh, extractivist society, uh, meaning exploitation without return. So this, for me, for us, are the main points that drive uh, the negative way we've been driving ourselves until now. What are the ways out? I mean, there are many ways. We, we right now, we're doing all kinds of courses on uh, action models, what we could do up, uh, from, uh, uh, to get out of this situation. Sure, we have to promote a society and a change of society, not a reformist view of what can be done nowadays, based on ecological solidarity. This is a very simple sentence, but when you extract every word uh, out of it, you see how complex it is. Uh, because a change of society can be decided like that. And also to think and implement an ecological responsibility. This, these words also are very uh, have their own weights. So let's start again. So 
Okay, so we're going to go a bit back in history, as I told you. So we have a planet under pressure since at least the 19th century. Some date back, the Anthropocene from uh, go back to the 16th century when you talk about Capitalocene, or some even go back to the uh, birth of agriculture, uh, 10,000 years BC, before Christ. So you can have all kind of datation, but nonetheless, uh, this pressure on the planet is more and more visible since, you can say, the 50s uh, of, the, of, the, of the 20th century. 1972, I think we all know, the Club de Rome published the Meadows report. Denis Meadows is one of the uh, world figure of these issues. And uh, so he discussed the fact that growth couldn't be infinite. And this is very important to see that we have limits. And this issue of the limits were not easily taken into account, even now. So uh, if even in 1972, the issue was to show how to avoid this overshoot, this uh, 30 years later, that, that is to say now, uh, the issue is to see how we can get back into the planetary boundaries, I mean, inside of it. And you will see that we have overpassed many of them already. And one thing which is important, at the, in 1972, uh, Meadows talked about the finiteness of resources. Nowadays, we don't talk about the only the finiteness of resources, but also of the limited capacities of certain ecological regulation mechanisms. You know, can talk about purification or other mechanisms. So we'll go fast because uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, like book well known, uh, uh, the Meadows uh, report, which was a mathematical modeling. Uh, uh, and it was a group of uh, engineers and mathematicians and scientists from the MIT. I don't know if you have something to ask or to say more, voilà. Luke, about that. It was in fact, uh, the work was done by Dennis Milos and Donella Milos. Oh, well. Two persons. And maybe some, just some drawings to, to understand what they did. Uh, first of all, you have some scenarios of what is the future. It was uh, modeling, uh, as you said before, but for the first time, these models were uh, accessible to a large audience. It was the first time that uh, uh, people could understand what is the use of models in order to uh, foster the future and so on. Uh, another maybe important point, Oula. <laughs> This is also the view of a systemic view. Uh, of course, you have some uh, natural determinants of the environment, climate, uh, resources, and so on. But there is also the interaction with the economic model. And it was what we could uh, call today a first view of the socio-ecosystem. Uh, this is a view in which there is very strong interactions between the dynamics of biosphere and the dynamics of human society. And it was very new uh, at this moment. So, we have different books. Uh, if you want to go back to 1874, I mean, this book was very important for the was a, for the first environmentalist, and it was a, a recognition of the fact that the Earth was transformed by human action at a global scale. So this is a major step, you could say. Please say something about Swedish chemist. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> For the first time, uh, this guy uh, said, OK, we know the impact of CO2 on the radiative uh, budget of atmosphere. We produce more and more CO2 with uh, the consumption of coal. 
So normally, we should have impact on the atmosphere. Voilà. It's in 1896. Uh, so the problem was very clear from uh, rather one century and half. Mm. And after that, uh, this book also is very interesting because it is the first book written in the US in uh, 1948, translated into French the following year. And in this book, you have a view of the future, of the degradation of the planet. In fact, all the problems we have today were in this book, except climate change. Uh, at this moment, <laughs> it couldn't <laughs> catch uh, uh, climate change. But all the other aspects, and especially the degradation of ecosystems, the loss of biodiversity, the loss of soil, fertility, and so on, who, uh, was described uh, in this book. And in fact, this book had a lot of impact. Huh? There was many uh, uh, copies of this book. You can find it uh, today uh, very easily uh, in the bookshop. Another book, uh, which is a major book uh, uh, in the field, uh, wi which was written by a woman in 1962, I think, or 19, yes, 1962, Silent Spring. You have to reread it. I mean, it's a major book because it crosses aesthetics and environmental issues, meaning it's about the fact that birds were not singing anymore in the fields. I mean, the sense that we could, uh, that we can have uh, today also, because if you go out in the countryside, you feel like there are less birds than before, or even less insects, if you can t talk about buzzing. So this book was indeed a major book in the field. Jean Dorst is a French person. Right. <laughs> uh, this guy was a professor of uh, biology in uh, the Museum of Natural History in Paris. And he, he proposed uh, this book in 1965 about, in fact, uh, the loss of biodiversity, the loss of species. And this book was translated in uh, more than 20 uh, countries in the world. It was the first view of the crisis of biodiversity. And also, in this book, you have some pages about the link between the living world, the biodiversity, and policy. So there are some pages about ecological, uh, an ecological policy. It was quite new at this moment. So, I mean, I think you have heard of this guy. He is he introduced the, th the term of Anthropocene, which means that the Earth is impacted by human activity at a global scale. And this is, he, he got the Nobel Prize for it, so it was largely discussed. So I think you can find his text, his books, his uh, everything. And what is interesting, uh, it was introduced by a, a chemist, he was a chemist, Yes, chemist of the atmosphere. Yeah. Chemist of the atmosphere, and he talked about geology. This is what is interesting: this interaction between the earth and the the, the atmosphere. Yes, and maybe uh, the major uh, message uh, in this work is that humankind has become a major driver of the dynamic of the planet. He's explaining that for the probably the first time in the history of living organisms on the planet, we have one species able to modify different components of the biosphere. Climate, of course, but also erosion, a part of natural selection, and so on. And probably it's a unique episode of the history of uh, the living world uh, on the planet. That means that our responsibilities are very heavy. More than anything. More than anything. Uh, yes, in 2005, uh, for uh, also for the mm, rather the first time, uh, we had um, a study of the state of ecosystems around the world, of course, and something new, well, not really new, uh, about the ecosystem services.
this concept of ecosystem services is very important because now it is very, it is very popular. You go in a small city, you discuss, you discuss with a mayor, for example, immediately he will explain that he's going to, to, to plant a tree in the street because we want to sequester carbon as a very important ecosystem service. So it's a very popular concept. It's uh, funny for that. And in fact, what is it? It is simply a social view of the functioning of nature. Nature is functioning. For example, you have the, nutri uh, the cycling of nutrients of carbon of nitrogen. You have the formation of soil, the, the photo photosynthesis, and so on. So we have some services because nature finally de determines the quality of our life, of our environment. You have some support services. Supporting services. Supporting services means what you have to take with you when you go on other planets. Okay? This is really the basis of life. You have also some services about provisioning food. Food is the product of photosynthesis. Fresh water, the production of fresh water is linked to ecosystems. Wood and fiber, fuel, of course. You have also some services of regulation, regulation of climate, of flood, of disease, of water purification, and some services, aesthetic services, cultural services, educational, recreational, and so on. Okay. And on this part of the, of the drawing, I, I, I love this drawing. It's completely mad, finally. You have, for example, here, the freedom of choice and action. Your freedom of choice and action. And it is explained that there is a link between this functioning of nature. There is something somewhere you, you don't know, you don't feel it, but in part, partly, it determines the quality of your life, the quality of your choice. This is a sort of revolution of the vision we have of the relationship between people and nature, at least from the uh, Western, on dit ça? Western civilization uh, point of view. Nature is not only a resource, it is also something on which humankind depends. There is a relation of dependency between nature and humanity. And this is also very strong and very new. It's uh, because it, in this report, I don't know how many of you have read it, I hope all of you, I mean, uh, it's the first time that people say poor people will be more impacted by this degradation of the environment than rich people. And they say because many people do depend in fact of, I don't know, the supporting services, food, fire, uh, on, in their environment just to, for their well-being or for their being uh, early. This was a, but this concept was very much criticized because it was a way to uh, put nature into money, uh, into markets, you could say, and you could say if you preserve such amount of nature, you can have whatever well-being. And so there was this commodification of nature, which was very problematic. So, and last uh, landmark uh, is uh, of last landmark of not, not uh, only not, not the last last, but uh, for for this uh, course at least. I mean, is the 2009. Uh, work of Hoxholm and other guys about the planetary boundaries uh, and this, at this time there was like uh, nine limits of the planets uh, and the idea was uh, a growing of a safe and just development space for humanity. So you see it's a growing idea and this is these are the nine limits. I think you will see them better uh, I think, yeah. Uh, and uh, you see the nine limits of the planet and uh, the new one, because every time we discover a new limit of the planet and the plastic one or, or green water was, uh, I think, the, uh, among the last one. So you had exceeded boundaries uh, 
you have uncertainty zone and safety zone. As you can see, uh, some limits have been uh, already uh, overpassed. So what is interesting in this conceptualization of the Earth uh, is that it mixes the Earth as a globe, as a, at a global scale, and the idea of the inhabited uh, living Earth. So you have a mix of vision, uh, which is something that we're working on. I mean, if you look at back in history how ancient people viewed the Earth, for example, how we could imagine this globe, this herb. It's very recent that we see ourselves as being part of something which is, at this scale, lost in the universe. So we have had little time to uh, tackle it. So thresholds, you can, do you want to talk about thresholds? Uh, very interesting. Uh, oui. <laughs> I don't remember what we wanted to, to say, but just maybe, uh, of course, the value of the threshold uh, can be discussed. Uh, for example, for, uh, for CO2, it, it is at uh, 350 ppm, huh, if you yeah, understand. Like maybe it's more, maybe it's less. This is not the, the point. The point is that we see that this uh, CO2 is increasing very, very rapidly. And this is the reason why we believe that a limit has been uh, she talked about it, Natalie, earlier on, no? Maybe, right. Maybe. Right. Yeah. Okay. And what did she say? Because she asked us to ask you to see <laughs> if you did memorize <laughs> something on the <laughs> How many ppm in the atmosphere of CO2 is a threshold? 400. No. Combien? 400. 400. Not 350. Not 350. Bon, OK. <laughs> yes? Do they put our remaking this study because the last one was seven years ago already and uh, are they doing again the, the because it's the same group they published one in 2009 another one in 2015 mm -hmm. do you know if they are doing another one a new one but the planetary boundaries yes. uh, it's part of the same group it's not uh, i mean some people are joining and other are living but uh, oxford is uh, part of it at least which is the Mesurian center yeah. Uh, okay, and so when uh, when it was revised, this conceptual theme, uh, it was revised taking into account new uh, thresholds uh, such as the land use change. Uh, the report of the IPCC of 2018 is very uh, interesting in this regard because I am a geographer. So, I mean, land use change is a massive uh, is a massive issue for us. And uh, the IPCC said that uh, if we change the way we inhabit the Earth, we could change everything. So, I mean, this was the first idea also that it was not, we didn't have just to have some policies about carbon emission or, or such, but we could have only policies about land use. And this is something very different. So you can see this concept of global limits is very much recognized. Uh, and uh, uh, like the donut that you ever uh, heard of, the donut of Kate Rower, how many of you know of it? Everyone? Not everyone? But most everyone. We'll, we'll show it anyway. Uh, but these are. Uh, these are representation of the problem which have been adopted very much by uh, uh, elected people like Amsterdam, for example. If you work with the city of Amsterdam, they talk about planetary boundaries, they talk about the donut, and they try to see how they can use it in their policy making. So many of them are trying to, to use it. So, so maybe you have seen that before. This is just, yes, you've seen, no, yes. Well, don't consult. Yes, This one also maybe is interesting. Uh, you have seen that before yeah. also? Okay, do it please. So, the, do you know where we are, this one? 
Cop 21, c'est marqué. Oh, it's, it's I have no eyes, but you have no merit. So, okay. And he is, uh, well, I won't comment. I would be not nice. <laughs> so, whatever. Uh, you know about Cop of Paris. Uh, you have read about it. I mean, like, this was an agreement of 196 parties. What was interesting is, uh, at the time that it uh, recognized the fact that uh, the fact that all countries didn't have the same responsibility in the warming of the planet, and this is very important. Uh, this is uh, uh, where climate uh, gets into the diplomatic game, you could say, or geopolitical game, and also uh, the fact that every five years uh, goals should be revised. And also this mythical 1.5 degrees, which is, uh, I think, uh, very mythical because nobody believes in it anymore uh, in terms of not attaining these uh, thresholds. But everybody makes believe, you know, like a child uh, uh, trying to convince itself that, uh, yes, 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 everything is going to be okay, 1.5. So, Perhaps you have something to say about this one? Uh, yes. Uh, when you look at the emission of CO2 today, uh, you have three... Je suis toujours pour mon vocabulaire. Trois distincts. Three phases of, uh, of the uh, atmospheric carbon. One is in the ocean, the other one is in the atmosphere, and the last one, including now, is in the biosphere, that means in trees and uh, in soil. So it's very important that we have a, na a natural uh, mechanism of carbon uh, sequestration. Uh, and as you know, uh, very often it is told that if we uh, increase carbon sequestration by forest, we will have a part of the solution. In fact, it, it is not so clear because when you look at uh, the ability of forest or carbon se to sequester carbon, from the CO2 point of view, there is no problem because there is a natural limitation of photosynthesis of trees. In fact, in the, act in the present condition of, uh, of atmosphere, trees lack of CO2. The maximum of growth of the trees is around 700 and 800 ppm of CO2. So that means that today they are, they are not at their maximum of, uh, of growth. But in fact, this is a simplistic view. Because of course, uh, trees need CO2, but they, they also need uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on. And when we make experiments in the field, we see that if you increase the CO2 in the atmosphere during in experimental conditions, you see an increase of the growth and an increase of the uh, CO2 sequestration. But after four or five years, this decrease, and finally after 10 years, we have no effect of the increase of CO2 concentration. That means that the sequestration by forest is partly omit also. Yes, we have a potential if we increase the surface of the forest, but not with the present forest. So there is a contradiction between uh, the carbon sequestration by forest, agriculture, and so on. Uh, of course, this view of forest comes from uh, a view of the uh, global biogeochemical cycle of uh, carbon. Here you have the atmosphere with the increase due uh, to human activities. So we have one third more CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, more than one third now, uh, due to the combustion of fossil soils. Look at the amount in vegetation. The amount in the vegetation is more or less equal to what we have in the atmosphere. But we have also in the soil a big amount of uh, carbon. So it is true that, in theory, if you can uh, play with this amount here, you could have a significant impact on the atmosphere. And this is uh, this type of data that uh, 
makes that we see uh, the forest as potential uh, uh, compartment <coughs> pardon, for carbon uh, sequestration. Does it have to turn or this No, that's So if we look at um, the history of the emission of CO2, of course, we have a part, the, the main part of the emission is due to the combustion of uh, hydrocarbon, uh, coal and uh, oil. But also, uh, this is this, by the change of the land use. When you destroy a forest, of course, you uh, change the nature of carbon. You go from organic carbon in the trees to mineral carbon as CO2 from the vegetation. But what we forget is that also in the soil, you have an emission of CO2 in the soil. When you look at uh, a soil that is cultivated each year, in fact, even in the long term, you have an emission of CO2. It is slower and slower with time, but you have an emission of CO2. And of course, when you change a forest into a crop field, you have a very big emission of CO2. This is a part of the global uh, emission. After that, you have um, methane and N2O. Uh, these two uh, compounds are linked also to the production uh, of food uh, for, uh, for human. Uh, if you increase, for example, the surface of a rice uh, field, in fact, this culture is underwater. Underwater, you have anoxic condition, your lack of oxygen, and in this condition, the degradation of organic matter uh, go until uh, methane. And it is the same for N2O. N2O comes from nitrite you put in the field. For example, in winter, you have a lot of water in the soil, your lack of oxygen, and in this condition, nitrite is converted into uh, nitrous oxide. So in fact, it is directly uh, linked to uh, the evolution of agriculture. So I think we will go fast on this one. I think you have seen, uh, except if you have something to say about it, meaning uh, this is about temperature. So you have seen much of it uh, and how much it has been uh, elevating. Uh, I want to get to the idea. No, no. So, Ah. Please go, because this is your This is my part. <laughs> yes, of course, there is a climate change, but there is also biodiversity change and a very uh, rapid loss of uh, biodiversity. Uh, what does it mean? That means, of course, that we lose some species. That means that we lose some genetic information. And so we reduce the diversity of living organisms. And as you probably know, the diversity of organisms between species, within species, is a key for the capacity of living organisms to adapt, to change. If there is no variation, variation between and within species, you, you, you have no uh, ability to adapt to climate change. That's a key point. So if we reduce biodiversity, we reduce the solution of adaptation of living organisms. That's a key point. The second point, it is also that we, all, of course, uh, affect the functioning of ecosystem. In the next uh, lecture, I will show you some results. Uh, we know now that in many situations, it is maybe not a general rule, but in many situations, we have a positive link between the number of species, for example, and the productivity, or the number of species and uh, the resilience, uh, for example, uh, resilience versus uh, dryness period or something yes. like that. So we know that we, if we lose biodiversity, normally we lose productivity and resilience. And this is what we call here uh, the impact on ecosystem uh, uh, functioning. With climate change, you have a movement of the uh, climatic zone so species have to follow this climatic zone, this movement. And of course, some species are not able to, to move uh, rapidly. And so we know that the race 
between climate and species will be lost by a lot of uh, species. Yes, you have a question. Um, what do you mean productivity? Excuse me? What do you Pro mean productivity? Uh, productivity is the amount of uh, living matter produced, for example, by a grassland or something like that. And of course, if you decrease or degrade biodiversity, <laughs> you degrade ecosystem services because, in fact, most of the ecosystem services are directly linked to the activity of uh, biodiversity. Qu'est-ce que c'est que ce truc? Je ne sais pas. Pass. <laughs> well, the, the idea showing that was that biodiversity is not just specific ah, categories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's the uh, interdependency and interrelation between these different species, species and ecosystem and habitat and landscape. So when you think about biodiversity, especially when you talk about, for example, in cities, often the mayor comes and says, we're going to put trees, we're going to put biodiversity, and never thinks about how a tree in itself is not biodiversity. Biodiversity is a functioning system. So uh, this is very important because people are, are, are confused between these different uh, ways of seeing biodiversity. So this is the erosion of biodiversity. Um, I don't know if you... Uh, yes, in fact, uh, of course, the loss of biodiversity is a natural uh, process. If you look at the history of Earth, uh, the present estimate of the number of species that have disappeared is around 98 or 99 percent of species have disappeared in the history of, uh, of Earth. And we have five major crises of biodiversity. What, what is a crisis? In fact, a crisis is a difference between the rate of extinction and the rate of speciation, the rate of appearance of new species. When you have a uh, non balance uh, between the two processes, you can have an increase of species or a decrease of species. So we had in this story four major crises of biodiversity. Uh, the most important was during the Permian area. In the ocean, probably, we have lost uh, between 80 and 90 percent of marine species, but during at least one million years. Uh, we know now that during the whole history of the planet, we had 60 episodes of extinction. So it's something normal. The question today is, of course, that the rate of extinction is very much higher than the rate of speciation. So it's clear that we go uh, to a, a very important period of extinction. And it's, it's important to, to explain that because many people say, OK, uh, uh, we are losing some species, but it is not a problem. In the history, we had a lot of species that have disappeared. Yes, but they have disappeared, for example, during the Permian era. The, the, the very hard period of extinction, 80% of species disappeared during one million years. At the moment, we know, uh, we will see that next uh, week, that, for example, we have lost during the last five centuries at least between 2 and 3% of the species we knew five centuries ago, so it's uh, an underestimation in only five centuries. So the rate is at least uh, 1,000 more rapid than the average rate of the extinction of species during the history. You had the question? Yeah. Um, I've been reading about keystone species. And there are some identified keystone species that help it balance, are important to balance the ecology of certain areas. Mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering is, because we've had all these sort of mass extinctions, some of these keystone species being part of the more endangered, is there some sort of like economic impact indicator of how much we're losing in terms of like money 
Oh. When we lose these keystone species, because like if there's damages or there's fire, forest fires, things like that. Well, personally, I don't know this type of studies, but I'm sure uh, they exist at least uh, for marine ecosystems with overfishing and so on. We have a very good example of the effect of the reduction of the abundance of keystone species. Uh, f for very often, they are top predator, and in fact, you have some uh, uh, effect, uh, many effects, uh, uh, cascading effects. Voilà. <laughs> uh, and so, in this condition, I suppose we have some economic studies of the effect here. For terrestrial uh, environment, I don't know. Is working well. on this issue. I think he's well. working because he is working on rewilding. And when you talk about rewilding, often you will reintroduce some key stone species in order to, and so you can assess how much uh, value it adds to the place. Yeah. I don't know how it, it does it, it perhaps it, even in terms of ecosystem services. I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, well, this is what I explained before. Uh, Five centuries ago, we have the first good description of species, big trees, big animals, uh, because of the beginning of the travel around the world uh, by, by naturalists. And so we are able to follow these species that have been described at this moment. And you see that between the different uh, types of animals, we have something around um, 1.5 on average, extension loss. We have lost. We have lost one percent five of the species we observed uh, five centuries ago. So it's a clear measurement of the extension rate with a big underestimation. So the limit. It's very complicated to decide what is the limit uh, of the extinction. Uh, this uh, data comes from uh, the history of the extinction. The history of the extinction is not very precise, of course, because you have to take into account uh, geological data and so on. So it is not very, uh, it is not exact, of course. Uh, but we, uh, we can see uh, that the rate today is at least 1,000 more rapid than the average rate uh, in the history. And this is uh, with this type of data that was calculated uh, this, uh, this limit, OK? Now, just to f for the fun, <laughs> uh, a few years ago, in 2000, uh, 2018 or 19, I don't remember, uh, people said, what is the weight of the living organisms on the, on the planet? Uh, so they made a study expressed as carbon, but well, it's a common uh, unit to measure living organisms. And what we see? We see is that, of course, the planet is dominated by plants. We know that from a long time. And we have also a lot of uh, microorganisms and a small amount of animals. And if you look of th to these animals, well, in fact, we know that we have a lot of invertebrates. We have a lot of fish, in fact, in terms of mass, of biomass. Okay. And we have mammals human and livestock. And we, if we make a focus on, life, on this part, we see that, in fact, we have eight times more humans than mammals today. We have rather two times more farm animals than humans. Farm animals means the cows and the chicken, more or less. And we have 14 times more farm animals than wild mammals. So, in fact, from a quality of course, we have data, we have quantities, and so on. But from a qualitative point of view, we have changed, in fact, the structure of the living organisms on the biosphere. And 
As for finally, uh, uh, what explained Crudzen, uh, he, he was explaining that humanity was a driver of climate and so on, but in fact we are also uh, the driver. This one is uh, difficult to read. Huh? <laughs> this is the objective. <laughs> Eight times more mass than um, it wasn't than mammals, but like also include wild mammals. Yeah, yeah, wild mammals. Not livestock. Not livestock. Right. Alors, this is what you explained just before. Um, functioning. The functioning. In fact, very often when we speak of biodiversity, we speak of species, and we see biodiversity as an addition of species. But as you say, there is no addition. There is interaction. What does it mean? It means that A is modifying B, and B is modifying A. Okay? This is the concept of interaction. And in fact, a real ecosystem is this type of, of thing. Uh, this is here the uh, description of the interaction we have uh, between species in a lake. And as you said before, you have so many interactions that it is very complicated to, to make a representation of that. But what does it mean? It means that if you change something here, for example, probably the change will be transferred to different uh, components of the, of the ecosystem, different actors of the ecosystem, different process of the ecosystem, at least in terms of intensity. And so the big challenge of ecology as a science today is to predict this type of change. And this is the reason why very often we, we explain uh, when we want to manage ecosystems and so on, so please do the minimum and the best way to make uh, a good management of ecosystems, the best way to make ecological engineering is to do nothing. Because in fact, if you do something with this complexity, in fact, you don't know what you do. And this is exactly the situation. For example, for me, the agriculture is a perfect example of that. We have organized the landscape, we have selected some organisms in order to increase one function, the productivity, but we have forgotten that uh, uh, a plant in a crop field or a bacteria in a crop field follow the same rules than a bacteria in the uh, primitive uh, rainforest. So in fact, we changed something and we had many uh, side effects side, side effect, that we were not able to predict. But what is well. interesting in social terms, because if you look at the social uh, read this book about adaptation to climate change of many species, especially in the States. I mean, many social movements have decided to save nature, for example, to save a species of butterfly mm -hmm. which can't hop from one mountain to the other, so they take the butterfly and they bring it up and off. And ecologists are very much against it, but people do feel that doing that they do something. So you have like this strange uh, fight between this social movement trying to save species and ecology saying, well, this is so complex. If we bring this species of butterfly on this other mountain, it may de destroy other species there. So we don't know how to make it. So you see, it's like this adaptation to climate change will be very complex as, as you know. So. What is it? Uh, ah, yes. Uh, <coughs> this is the evolution of the extension risk. Uh, the extension risk can be estimated through the area of the habitat. If you have a small habitat, you have a higher extension risk uh, for the question of uh, genetic, in fact. And also, uh, we know that uh, the, the question of uh, uh, the, the fragmentation of landscape is a key point because in fact the populations and the ecosystem are not isolated. They exchange information, they exchange individuals. We have the concept of meta-population. All the population of a bird are more or less linked 
in the space and sometimes at a on very long distance. And also uh, an ecosystem, a forest, is not completely independent of the other forest. They all function as a meta ecosystem or a meta population. So if you have fragmentation by roads, uh, by cities and so on, of course you decrease this exchange of information and, and individuals and so you decrease, uh, you increase the risk of extinction. Uh, well, for example, uh, a, a concrete consequence of that is a policy of uh, green and blue network. We try to organize some ecological continuities in order to reduce the risk of extinction, allowing the exchange of individuals and, uh, and genes and so on between the different populations. That's a key point. And this is a good policy based on a very good scientific knowledge. So there is no doubt about that. So about, about that, about the interest of a continuity, big uh, uh, high surface of habitat and so on. It is well known for uh, 50 years at, le at least. And this is, you see, uh, two maps, one in 2000 and one in 2100, but this is an estimate, 2100, about Fagus Silvatica, which used to cover all, all lands in Europe. I mean, this was one of the major trees in Europe, which is slowly disappearing. If you follow the list of uh, species at risk are disappeared, I mean, 40 percent, I think, of trees, of European trees, will be disappearing uh, in the in the decades to come, meaning that it will change or disappear. And nowadays, if you go around Paris near Compiègne, for example, I mean, they have uh, they have a lot of problems with trees there, and they call for people and social mobilization, environmental mobilization, to help them. Uh, try to see which tree is dying, which tree is not, and how to deal with that. So you see it's like a difficult situation for many trees in France. Yeah, and from a very concrete point of view, that means that a tree that is here today has to go here during the next 100 years. And we know that naturally it is not possible. The distance of dispersion, the migration rate, of these trees are not uh, enough rapid to be able to move uh, in parallel with the movement of the climate areas. And so we have now quite a new science, the science of assisted migration. So we imagine to take some trees, to take some animals, and to put them artificially uh, in the north. And this is a very complex a very complicated situation because if you, have, if you produce trees, if you, if, you, if you manage a forest, the question is, okay, uh, the climate will be, will be very different in 50 years, so what I do? I wait, or I put now some trees that are not in this ecosystem to have an anticipation on the climate change. But for example, you, you, you took a tree from the south of France, you put it in a forest in the north of France. It's, it's a good idea for climate change, but you put a tree of the south in an ecosystem that at this moment is an ecosystem of the north. So we have some risk uh, with uh, disease. Uh, we don't exactly know because we put this tree in this complex system. What are the consequences of that. So in fact, it's very complicated today. And there is very difficult discussions between scientists. Assisted migration, is it a good idea? No. And the response, uh, the, the answer is not as far from clear. So you have this very complex uh, image about ocean acidification. Uh, we'll go quickly, I don't know, because we, we don't have much time. So anyway, you, you will get this uh, slideshow for yourself so you can read what it is about. But the main issue, because there are many social issues behind, perhaps you can sum up in one sentence about... Oh this. yes, it's very clear. Simple, if you 
put more CO2 in the water, you create carbonic acid. And so if you have more acidity, it is more complicated for organisms to uh, produce their uh, shells. Exactly. Uh, it's very simple to understand. So with this, this edification uh, of the ocean, we uh, make uh, the production of uh, all the uh, organisms with uh, calcium carbonate in their organization very, very difficult. So you won't be uh, eating oysters anymore? <laughs> Mussels or oh, whatever? Oh, yeah. So this is the donut we were talking about. So how far of you know about it? It has been shown by, uh, by uh, in many places. So you have what we call plancher social. Uh, how do you call that in, in English? Uh, well, social floor. Uh, and the outer boundaries, meaning there is a, a, a safe place where we can have uh, a, a social development in between these planetary boundaries and what we can expect in terms of what is a good life. And once again, it is very schematic, as you can see. I mean, uh, it's true, it doesn't take into account the fact that one doesn't expect the same good life in India than in Paris or wherever, you know. It is very, so if you have uh, public policies founded on this kind of scheme, it has to land, I mean, this kind of thing, and to see what it means locally. And one way to see how it means something locally is to, interrogate people to make like citizen convention and to discuss collectively what do we think is this place in between uh, social uh, I issues and planetary boundaries. So this is one uh, representation uh, of, this, uh, of these issues with uh, 11 distinct necessities of life. I mean, it can be discussed very much, for example, education, health, and what do we expect in terms of drinking water and hygiene and such. And this environmental ceiling, which is imposed uh, from the planetary boundaries, so, and these ones are uh, very much evolving. So, uh, this uh, Kate Howard notes, and you can uh, read yourself a word, that uh, all economies have been failing in terms of linking economic growth and social growth and, uh, and uh, respecting planetary boundaries. Uh, and you will see another scheme just after which shows which countries have been respecting the most. In the same time, social, uh, social limits and planetary boundaries. So the idea, uh, as Elinor Ostrom said, is to change our economies. Uh, you know the work of Elinor Ostrom on commons. We will discuss it later on. I mean, I think you have many interventions about that. Uh, this is a complex issue, and uh, not, not, not the, I mean, not, uh, we don't have enough time in this introduction to discuss comments, but I think it is a major issue to see how it can change sufficiently the economy in order to be inside this space in terms of development and uh, collective life. So another work is this work. Do you know this work? Yes? Uh, because in the donut model, there's an assumption of what the good life is. Yeah. And uh, uh, like, why should we buy into it? Well, it's not only an assumption. I mean, it's like this one. Huh? Uh, it's a calculus. Yes, this is how you say it. I mean, they have, you know, established uh, it's true. It's not only an assumption, it's partly an assumption. I mean, it's like something that, uh, that can be changed. For example, education, 
some people do things that we don't need education, but part of this calculus is to say that uh, we need so much education and for that we need so much uh, energy, so much uh, food consumption, so much etc. etc. So uh, it's, it can be discussed. I mean, it's, uh, for example, there is a democratic quality uh, in, on this scheme, so that's part of this uh, uh, discussion about what is a good life. Yes? What? The calculation, the calculus is oh, done this, by uh, you, 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 you can find it, this was a paper which was published in Nature Sustainability. Uh, so that, you, that, that uh, can imply a lot. Who says what's on the list? Is uh, sure, neutral. sure, sure. I mean, it's obviously, yeah. Uh, and once again, what we think is health, hygiene, education, democratic life, everything depends on a certain set of values which have to be discussed. I mean, that's uh, obvious. But right now, that's how people... And the next scheme is more interesting. For example, you see biophysical boundaries, uh, the more transgressed, the more on the right side, and you have the social threshold, the one I showed you just on the slide before, and you see that uh, some countries, for example, the US, Canada, and all these countries, they, have, they are very much towards uh, the, uh, the, the, the biophysical boundaries transgressed, and in the same time, they don't achieve so much social good. I mean, if you look at the countries which are uh, still transgressing many biophysical boundaries but achieving more social good, it's more like Germany, Netherlands, uh, and you find these countries all up there. And if you go in the middle, I mean, you have different, for example, this one, Vietnam, uh, you could say that it has many social good and not transgressing so much uh, biophysical boundaries. So meaning that the, it's not, uh, it's not, come uh, on, inevitable. It depends on social soil. But you should read this article and how it calculates all this social good and this this kind of you know uh, table uh, and you know and they, they they explain how they discuss the Gini index for equality as a social good and such a thing. So uh, what they say, what uh, uh, O'Neill say is universal achievement of, of more qualitative goals, for example, high, quali uh, high quality of life for every country will require such a level of resource that it's impossible uh, right now. So we, we need to change system uh, and not just uh, have strategies that improve uh, physical and social supply systems. So one thing that uh, you know well uh, is there are many players on the, in, around this table uh, talking about environmental issues and talking why we, did, we, we come to this stage of catastrophe. It means that many players are convinced that there are more interest in uh, staying in this dynamic of catastrophes than doing something else. I mean, you, if you read some books about catastrophe, you can see, for example, the tsunami of, uh, of uh, uh, what? Uh, yeah. 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 Well, whatever. You see that some uh, corporates have been taking advantage of this situation just to push people out and just to build up a new building on the coast, making some uh, intervention uh, valuable just after this catastrophe. 
So this is something which is quite complex when you talk about uh, that some people have negative states. So we have all these players, for example, also the, the, the group of industrial uh, actors that have denied the effects of uh, gas emission for so long. Uh, you know more about that because the media has been echoing very much uh, these things, but uh, if you think that uh, I, I came into my PhD was in 1990, at the beginning of the 90s, and at the time we knew already that. I mean, that's something that we can know something and not move a bit. I mean, knowledge is not a guarantee of social change. This is something very important to, 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 and this is kind of surprising, uh, but in fact, uh, it means that, uh, that uh, we have to, I mean, when I, because since the 90s, people have, have been saying we just need to sensibilize persons and to make know of, of the stakes of climate change and everything like that. We have been talking very much with Luke about that since at least 30 years, and not so much has changed. So what do you make of knowledge? So, I mean, you wonder, do knowledge is uh, sufficient to make a society change? I mean, it should have been because science was somewhat created in order to make people uh, be able to change their future. Uh, but, in fact, it is not the case. So, what we see also, also players, I won't have time to discuss that, are cities and local governments. They have been playing often against, uh, against even their national governments. For example, you think in the United States, many cities have been doing many things, uh, even though the government was not doing much. Do you have some... Perhaps you want to add something mm -hmm. about it. So, and, uh, so it's interesting to see uh, that there are many things which have been done. Also, citizens and local mobilization. Uh, you have a major change these last years about this mobilization. The more they go, the more uh, they get from, uh, they, they go through law. Uh, and uh, more, uh, right now there are more than 2,000 trials at uh, global scales about these issues. I mean, it can be against corporates, it can be uh, against national governments, like in France, where the L'Affaire du Siècle, uh, which was widely publicized. Uh, we have local, very local uh, trials also, uh, citizen groupings and trying to tackle with local pollutions. So I would say that we will have uh, uh, next week a whole course about that, that mobilization has been very active this last 20 years and very much evolving the strategy of attack. Uh, and even if you take the deep growth movement, for, for example, uh, they have been thinking very much about strategy. Uh, and that's something you have to take uh, strategy, meaning that uh, we, we, we don't need just a word or uh, even uh, a future's, future way of conducting ourselves. We need strategy to think who are the players, how they hold the scene, and what can we do about that. And that's something very important because uh, uh, we had this meeting, uh, which was called Rebellion Scientist, inspired from Extension Rebellion. And you could see, looking at that, that these people were not organized at all. And uh, that's something. So, uh, and it's very important to organize ourselves because more and more citizens are becoming anxious about inaction and collective inaction and it has real effect on public health, meaning it has a cumulative impact on people, uh, more or less. So, a concept which has been very much used, do you know this concept? 
overview. So I guess in economy it's more well known than uh, because this is a field of economy where you have the more disorder, uh, cognitive dissonance. <laughs> That's it? Okay, I'm making fun of economists because I am not one. So, uh, and uh, also if you, I mean there are many, many analyses about ignorance and ignorance meaning uh, denial, more or less, uh, and you have to think about them. I mean, as a scientist going on the, doing a lot of field work, when I go to watch people, interrogate them, and try to understand what they understand of climate change, of all this issue, you can have religious worldviews, you can have survival itself, conducting more of the person, destruction of consumer culture, meaning you can't, if you doing field work, for some of you, you will be doing field work with me uh, in the southern part of France, you don't have to prejudge what's important for people and why they do deny the importance of climate change. I think we have almost finished. This is the different courses you will have, and I have to talk to you about how we're going to assess uh, your assiduity to this course. Uh, so, I suggested that to Luc. He said earlier on that it was very good, but I didn't have yet a return from him, so I don't know. So, last year, the thing we did is to ask you for a poster, uh, to, 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 to create small groups, like four or five, and to propose different posters on different topics that you will have uh, seen during this course. This year we're going to do something different. We're going to, you all going, and I don't have the, the, the topics right now because as I didn't have the answer from Luke, uh, I didn't think of bringing it, bringing it here. You're all going to discuss about inequalities. I mean, this will be the issue this year, but from different perspectives. So the so small groups will be created uh, around this issue of inequalities. It can be uh, inequalities and adaptation, inequalities and mitigation, inequalities at different scales. What are the stakes of these inequalities? Inequalities and justice how mobilization, for example, do take into account inequalities to claim for justice. I mean, you have different kind of inequalities, gender inequalities facing the catastrophes uh, in southern countries. For, for example, you have the work of Johnny Seeger, I think it's her name, and she has done a tremendous work showing how women are much more concerned uh, by uh, climatic uh, or environmental catastrophes. So I will uh, send it to Rima or to David, who will send it to you, uh, the different topics. There are nine of them, uh, and you can uh, disperse yourself uh, between the different groups with these different topics around inequalities. Then you will present before the whole group what you have done on this uh, topic. Then after each issue and presentation, we'll all discuss together. So this will be a collective debate. Uh, I mean, I, I, I know a bit about this topic, but not so much. And you have to keep thinking that it's not social inequalities, it's a cross between environmental and social inequalities, which is the point here. And how can we land in terms of climate justice? I mean, how does it affect people in this neighborhood and not just at the global scale. How these inequalities are very important at all scales in terms of compensation, in terms of policy making, in all this, you know. And also in terms of uh, that the rich don't just uh, don't uh, have to care about these issues and have to pay for them. So as a question, yeah? 
is there a paper associated with the presentation or just a presentation? A small paper would be good. Okay. Doesn't need to be very, it's not, uh, uh, but uh, a small paper would be good. If, especially because uh, year after year more of you are coming so it's interesting perhaps for the next generation to see how the debate has been evolving yes and so do you think five people is a small group? what like, how I, I have, I have a big guess how many topics are on five people I, I have, uh, but we have to discuss it with Luke more because uh, it was just an indicative uh, list of 10 topics around inequalities, uh, but we have to see if uh, 10 is enough. How many of you are there? 40? So it's good then. It makes uh, groups, uh, four people per group. It's workable. But maybe sometimes two groups giving different mm -hmm. views of the same topic. Right. Yes. Uh, is there a, do we know approximately uh, when this is uh, going to happen? When this uh, should be here? Just for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> when this is going to happen, this uh, horror movie will take place after Christmas. No, I mean, uh, I, I think we'll, uh, the last call is in January 6th, so it will happen in February, something like that. I mean, you have to ask that David, or he disappeared, he didn't wait for us. <laughs> I'm not so sure to understand, because you say that we will hold presentations, and then there will be a debate. But I yeah, I was, uh, they were asking me when this uh, assessment of the... Uh, will take place, and I say I just after Christmas is a gift. Yes, I think it's in the timetable. Oh, I'll check. So, so yeah, you, you say that there will be debates yeah. and presentations. Yeah. So, and this would be at the same time every presentation after Christmas. Or, or will it, yeah, I, I think the interest is to have strong views to be able to discuss collectively, but nobody has a right answer. It is a very fast evolving subject. And you have to take into account many things which have been changing. So, I mean, read about inequalities and how it affects uh, this. Uh, I mean, even Piketty has been integrating in, in, his, uh, in his calculus the environmental inequality. So, I mean, you can look online, some carbon emission inequality, I think. So, and Luc Chancel, uh, uh, who is uh, one of his uh, students, has been writing about environmental inequalities. And in France, the super committee has been saying that the, the uh, climatic justice will be the next uh, way to uh, uh, reform all policy making. I mean, when it will be the, the axis of all reforms. So I think, that's interesting to delve into this topic. Are there more questions? No, I don't think it's set yet. So we have to set a date in January. Yeah. We do that together. Okay. So, I mean, how do you think, David, I mean, uh, do, how do they going to create groups? I mean, do they have to, to Will it be informal until the, the time of the presentation, or do they have Let's to... Let's say that they have, I mean, they can discuss together, by the, uh, maybe we can have a, a short exchange next for the, on the 29th, if you already have an idea, and then we, we will define the groups by the beginning of October. On the session. So, are there any topics to give us, or are we going to... We're going to give you topics. Uh, the I Ten different topics. Yeah, ten different. Are we going? I just waited for his yes. <laughs> <laughs> so are we going to send it to you for Rima? I think. Yeah, yeah. We, we will create a yes, some kind of wish list or form, and so you will be able to. Put it in. I'm waiting for the because it's, they have to give me the topic. Yes. So there are no more questions. So thank you, everybody. It's very hot. So see you next week. <laughs> uh,